Welcome everyone. This session is all about stepping up your Dynamo game and reaching a broader audience. Glad you joined in again. My name is Tim and Hazel and I'm a senior technical designer at Walter P. Moore and it's been a privilege bringing AEC tech experts directly to your desk. As you can see next to me today, we have another guest host. Say hi to Kyle Martin in the chat. Kyle's an initiator and he's been encouraging computational design thinking in the Boston area by creating learning spaces for years. We actually started our journeys together um, being taught by some of the greats. I don't know where he finds the time, but he's a founder of Dyna Militia, Beyond AEC Hackathons, and in Cone, Boston. He's a design technology manager at Gensler and is the perfect guy to be hosting this session. With that, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Timon. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm excited to be with you guys today to be a guest host for Yourdesk University. So it's this is a series of technical presentations and expert panels that are aimed at keeping everybody connected as we're all kind of sequestered from home these days around the globe. So we wanted to have a forum where we could all continue to share and continue to stay connected. Uh, I just wanted to highlight another session coming up this week on the 30th, which is this Thursday. We have Ian Keough from Hypar, Mustafa Rodsari from Ladybug Tools, Conrad Sabone from Bad Monkeys, who will all be on an expert panel talking about making new things, which is going to be a focus on what it's like to develop new tools, new softwares for the industry, as well as entirely new companies in the case of all three of those guys. So for today's presentation, we have Dana DeFilippi, who is a BIM technologist at Smith Group, as well as her colleague Richard Schmidt, who is an application developer at Smith Group. And they are both very well connected with various DC user groups, as evidenced by Dana, who I see is wearing her t-shirt today from Dynamo DC. Um, and they're going to kick it off with a presentation all about how Dynamo Player can be helpful for transforming your everyday Dynamo scripts into something that's easily digestible and scalable for a broader audience at your company or beyond. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it off to these guys to take it away. Thanks, Kyle. And thank you for having me. Thanks for everybody for joining us today and anybody who's listening after the fact. Please, we want this to be interactive. So please utilize the chat um, and ask us your questions. We definitely will answer them as we go. Um, as everyone mentioned, um, my name is Dana. I work at Smith Group. And as I mentioned last week in my presentation hosting Marcello, I like being crafty and I like playing a Nintendo. So something I brought today is some Nintendo remotes that I made out of paper. So some fun things um, that I like to do outside of them. How about you, Richard? What have you been doing these days outside of them? Cat! <laughs> Chonks. Um, awesome. <laughs> and trying not to go stir crazy. That's really all cooking a whole lot. Best we all grateful, can do. Grateful for our pets these days, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, without further ado, I have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and talk about Dynamo for the Masses. So as we've uh, been talking, we definitely want to make Dynamo accessible for all users. Um, as we mentioned, um, myself and Richard both work at Smith Group. Um, we are in the IT or BIM side of things, right? So I develop uh, Revit workflows, Revit templates, families, et cetera. Richard, on the other hand, is an application developer and really helps us out with deploying things, pushing things out, creating awesome applications that our Revit users are able to use on a daily basis. Uh, so at Smith Group, we have the ideology that we want everybody to be Revit users. I'm sorry, Dynamo users, right? Computational users in some way. We know that not everybody are gonna be, is gonna be creators uh, for Dynamo scripts. So we like to assume that 5% will be originators. Um, and hopefully we can get a good amount of that percentage, 100% uh, to be at least modifiers, right? People who are actually going in modifying scripts, um, doing different things to uh, customize the script for their project need. Uh, maybe it's a different client need, maybe it's a deliverable that they need to deliver and they can slightly modify scripts. Um, but we want the rest of that population, let's just say 70% who's not in Dynamo, to still be users of computational workflows. So in this respect, we use Dynamo Place Player so that everybody can benefit from these types of workflows. Once again, the way that we approach this at Smith Group is through Dynamo Player. Uh, it provides a pretty easy interface um, and by utilizing Dynamo Player, we can actually start to work this into some of our standard workflows. 
So we refer this as our BGP or BIM guidelines and procedures. And you can see here that we have our uh, life safety occupancy calculations completely documented, including Dynamo Player. So the workflow actually incorporates steps of Dynamo Player. Um, if you haven't seen that, it is on Autodesk University if you're interested in incorporating Dynamo to your occupancy calculations. So there are some requirements for success, however, and that's where Richard comes in. So a few things that we need in order for Dynamo to be able to work on everybody's station. And maybe some of us who are on the BIM side and trying to deploy these types of workflows have realized, uh, first off, we really want everybody to have a central location for what we refer to at Smith Group as certified Dynamo player scripts. So that there's one library for all of the Dynamo scripts. Unfortunately, it's a little bit limiting. You can't have subfolders. It's you know, you kind of have to come up with a good naming system because it just goes in there alphabetically. That's okay, we work with it. Um, as you can see on this previous slide, it's just a really long list of scripts. So you kind of have to come up with a common nomenclature for those types of things. Secondly, or additionally, you really need a shared package library, right? We've all seen this, right? And a user goes and opens a Dynamo script and of course they have some deprecated notes. So one really wonderful thing in the latest editions of Dynamo is that they actually have the ability to show package dependency. So if you are working in Dynamo, you can actually see what packages are required for the script to, to run as expected. Um, but really, ideally, we want everybody to navigate or at least have path to the same package path, right? And of course, there's limitations, especially in previous versions of Dynamo where you don't want to be passed to a large server with a bunch of free space. Um, you know, and as we deal with multiple versions of Revit, we of course are forced to deal with multiple versions of Dynamo. So we want everybody to be able to play in a, in a well adapted uh, workflow and, and interface, if you will. So that's where the infrastructure comes in. And once again, Richard Smith with, uh, with Smith Group, will talk a little bit more on that. Thanks, Dana. Um, they do not make it easy, that's for sure. There's a lot of uh, constant change in the Dynamo environment as far as where things go and where to put, put files and what to edit. Um, but if you can get a handle on it, you can have some really amazing data that you can get access to. Um, we've been able through this same processes that we did to deploy Dynamo, retrieve this data about usage firm-wide. So we get to see just how many people and how many offices are using Dynamo um, and Grasshopper um, and seeing you know, what scripts that Dana has made or other creators that our firm have made and see just how popular they are and check in with those user bases, see if they like them, get feedback on that type of thing. So it's been a very powerful addition to see how we're using Dynamo, uh, but uh, where and how is actually very, very tricky. Um, so some important folders, uh, the Dynamo settings folder uh, is an XML file that contains the paths that will be used to load packages. Um, so you, you want that to be the same on everyone's computer. Um, and that can be in a shared location or you can be replicating those packages to the user's machines. Um, Dynamo packages uh, are automatically set for each version to that version's folder number. So right now, between 2019, Revit 2020, and Revit 2021 that was just released, there are five different default folders for Dynamo. Uh, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.5. So they skipped 2.4 somewhere. I guess that one wasn't, wasn't good enough to get, get released. Um, the Dynamo player scripts themselves, um, there are three different versions of Dynamo player out there. Uh, there's one for 2019, one for 2020, and one for 2021. Um, between 2019 and 2020, uh, Autodesk moved Dynamo entirely with inside the Revit deployment. So instead of being in the Dynamo, Dynamo Revit folder, it's now in the Autodesk Revit for whatever version uh, Dynamo player folder. Um, 
the first time you open up Dynamo Player, it'll default to this script location. So at Smith Group, what we've done is use that location as our deployment location. So that the first time they go there, we see those Dynamo Player scripts right away um, in that default location. Um, and then the way we do that is through the Dynamo Player uh, default folder settings. There's deep in your local app data folder is a folder called Dynamo Player Instance and then a number. If you delete all of those, it goes back to the default. I don't know what all is in there. There's a whole bunch of junk, but it doesn't hurt it to delete it and it puts you right back where you started. Um, as far as deployment strategies, there's a few considerations. It's the scale of your office. Are you just one office or are you many offices um, and access? Like, do you need people to have these tools remotely? Uh, do you need to be able to change these tools and deploy them to remote staff. Um, it's a difference from being in the office, as we've all learned, getting something and then working remote and trying to get those same things. Um, so there's a variety of scales of services out there. Um, some of our deployments are done through SCCM, which is a Windows Deployment Manager. It's integrated in all our IT stuff at Smith Group. Um, for cloud stuff, we don't do this at Smith Group, but I was looking into it and uh, Dell has a, a technology called Unified Workspace, which is de deployment through the cloud. So you're able to authenticate and just pull these things from wherever. Um, a fun one that came out of the WeWork uh, development team a while back is the dot deployer. Um, it's opt-in though. You pick up, pull up a little tab and you're like, hey, I want this thing that someone made and you'll get your updates then. It, doesn't have the force that something like SCCM or a unified workspace does. And then what we did at Smith Group was kind of a combination. SCCM deploys parts of our ecosystem, but then we have custom add-ins for uh, Revit and for Rhino that do uh, the deployment of the actual scripts and packages and nodes. Um, and a lot of this was for flexibility so that the user can have their custom stuff and that we can tooth into that without disturbing their environment. Awesome, thank you so much, Richard. Of course, as you can imagine, that's been a huge help in getting all of this to work on everybody's computer. So once you have that figured out, which of course is a huge piece of it, right? Not going to uh, sweep that under the rug. Uh, then we can start to think about how we set up our Dynamo scripts to be Dynamo player friendly. So going to kind of completely change places here and uh, talk about Dynamo Player. So the idea is, is that we don't want everybody in Dynamo, right? Not everybody wants to open up Dynamo and play with visual nodes, get in there and start to maybe other things. Regardless of how organized we make our scripts or whatever it might be, this is a scary interface. I'm sure a lot of us who have opened up Dynamo for the first time can, can attest to that, right? How scary that was. It's just completely different or Grasshopper for the first time, right? How different it was uh, than what we're used to. So Dynamo Player allows us to have a much easier interface for our just general Revit users, right? The 70%, let's say, of our users to interface with. So you can see here, I have my inputs, I have my outputs, um, and of course we can run the script. So some things happened in 2018.1, of course, that's a while ago now, right? Three editions ago, um, where we got some additional sample graphs. It's nice. We got some Revit model name appended, so you know what Dynamo is actually running on. But most importantly, is we got the edit inputs button. And this is truly what makes Dynamo Player accessible to everyone, right? Regardless of your project, your project type, we can customize our Dynamo Player scripts, our Dynamo scripts, to be Dynamo Player friendly. So let's talk about a few ways that we can do that. First off, inputs, right? So first, a lot of the time we're gonna be using code blocks in our standard scripts. Those cannot be inputs. We're gonna use strings in uh, lieu of code blocks for our inputs. One thing that is required is that we right click on the node itself. In this case, I'm showing a string, tell it to be an input. Uh, for inputs, it 
is suggested but optional that you rename the node, right? Of course, within Dynamo Player, if my user just says string, it's kind of, um, you don't really know what that means. What is it that you're looking for? What is it the value that you're looking for? So we can rename that and make it a little bit more clear for our user. I will say, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but there are tons of input nodes, both out of the box and custom, uh, including selecting model elements, views, levels, element types, sheets, line styles. So lots of different ways that you can have your users specify inputs within your project. Some of the things that I'm gonna talk about is how you can provide additional flexibility to these inputs so that your user can really, really hone in on it. Now, a lot of people would say, do you use data shapes, right? Uh, data shapes is a really wonderful package within Dynamo that allows you to uh, have pop-ups within Revit, uh, utilizing Dynamo Player and other things. I try not to. If Dynamo Player can do it, I try to do it within Dynamo Player. And once again, it's just trying to get my users familiar with one single interface, right? this point, especially working remotely, we're having to learn all kinds of new applications, right? BIM 360 and all kinds of new things. So the fewer amount of interfaces that I can present to my user, the more likely they'll be to use it, right? It's familiar to them. It's intuitive. It's something that they're familiar with, okay? So lots of different inputs. Now, a lot of the time, we want to provide options for these inputs, right? And the way that I usually provide options, at least when I have two options, is through a Boolean, right? True or false, press coder zero and one, right? So essentially, you can come in here and you can say, do you want to do this or not, right? And if not, what else do you want to do? So you can see here, I say, do you want to name the print set with the revision name? true or false. And if it's false, what do you want to name the print set, right? And the way that we set this up within Dynamo is simply by uh, having, first off, that revision sequence is the input. Second of all, second off, you have the Boolean. You can see here that whenever I rename a node, I make a note as to what that node was, right? Because once you rename a node, it's kind of hard to tell what that node was originally. So might be a little bit redundant here because we know that's a Boolean, but I just go ahead and note it. That node was a Boolean. Uh, and you'll see here that I'm actually tying it in to an if or a conditional statement, right? So if you say true, it will be the Revit, uh, revision description. If it's false, then you can specify with a string what you would like that name to be. Another example here, uh, of a Boolean is with my area boundaries. Uh, once again, this is for mostly what we use for our occupancy values, right? So we translate our room boundaries over to area boundaries, right? Sometimes we don't need area boundaries, we just want areas or vice versa. So we can actually specify whether we want one or the other or both, okay? So one thing that I want to note is, I don't know about you, maybe Kyle, you've had a different experience the if doesn't always work. Have you noticed this, Kyle? So you can see here, I'm telling it to be true, but it's giving me an empty list. I have seen that when you use different functions, it seems to be picky sometimes on what you use. Like whether you, you push in a list or, I mean, yep. I tried to play with it, but it didn't seem to be consistent. So exactly. luckily I have Richard who created this wonderful little Python script for me. And so a lot of the times I, <laughs> very, very simple Python script. So that's why I put it here and I didn't even ask him if I could put it here. Um, so you can see here that a lot of the time I don't even use the if, I just automatically default to this Python because I know it's going to work. Uh, if you can get the if to work within your script, fantastic. Otherwise use this guy, this is a pretty big key part on those options, right? With, with the conditional statement. So with this particular workflow, I had to use the Python script to get that to work. So a little side note. So what if I have more than two options, right? What if I want to provide multiple options, three or more, to my user? In this case, you can see that based off of Smith Group standards, we're actually a multidisciplinary firm. 
based off of our BIM guidelines and procedures, we outline recommended work sets for each discipline. So by running this script based off the discipline you specify, it will automate those work sets for you. We'll create them all so you don't have to manually create them, right? So the way that we can do this is as you can see with that input, I'm actually allowing the user to specify an integer, right? Zero for architectural, one for electrical, two for mechanical, et cetera. And then by specifying that input and running the script, it then will manipulate what that specification was. So the way that we do that pretty simply here is by creating a list. Uh, you can see here, one thing that I want to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you'll notice whenever you try to edit an input node or really a node in general, you can't hit enter. It won't let you actually hit enter in there. If you hit enter, it's like you're done, right? It just completes out of the edit input um, or edit node name, right, rename. So if you actually, if what you do is if you edit the group, it lets you put enters and then copy that into the node name. And that will actually display much nicer within Dynamo Player. I know it's crazy that, <laughs> right? It's absolutely insane that we have to go through these hoops, but it's, it's actually much nicer of an interface to have it spaced out with, with actually breaks from the line uh, rather than you know, doing semicolons or whatever you wanna do. It's much easier for the user to read. So once again, update the group name, right? You're, you actually make a group of the node, name that, copy it and paste it into the node name. Do you remember where you learned that trick from or did you just figure it out one day? I just figured it out one day. I like That's renamed brilliant. the group. I renamed the group and I was like, why can't I rename the node that? And I think I just accidentally or like maybe just instinctually copied it into, I was like, oh, well, that worked. So, and in Dynamo Player, it looks great. So. Yeah. <laughs> Tip of the day right there. Tip of the day. Hopefully you guys heard the hack of Dynamo. <laughs> um, so, but you can see here that what's really doing the heavy lifting is the get item index, right? So essentially I've created a list of all of the different work set names to be created. And then based off the discipline that will get the item at index for that list, right? So the get item at index is really the, the beef of this script that's actually working to get that integer from the original list. So another one that we have like this is change case. Uh, this is also something that for whatever reason, there isn't a native node within Dynamo to do title case. So I was able to find something really, really easy script. If you, if you just Google it, title case Python, you can find that pretty easily. So you can see here, once again, using the title of the group, copying that into the node name, I'm able to get the uh, integer specification, right? So zero for lowercase, one for title case, two for uppercase. And I can um, create that list once again, the get item at index is doing the beef there, right? So I don't need to have data shapes to provide a list for me, right? I can have this all within Dynamo Player with minimal pop-ups, if any. Okay, a few tips here. First off, in, uh, when we have a category input, it's completely fine to leave that as an input, right? Just leave the category dropdown, node, tell it to be an input, no problem. The problem is when we want that to be a fixed value, okay? So for example, this script works with walls. That's not something that I want the user to change. It's always going to work with walls. The problem is that in different versions of Revit, there's different version, or I'm sorry, there's different amounts of categories, okay? You can see here that in 2019, there's 302 categories. In 2018, there's 292. So where I've specified walls in 2019, if I open that same script up in 2018, it jumps back to windows. So what I do instead is I use a category by name node. I fix it to be walls, okay? So that way it will work with every version. Because remember, of course, we want all of our users to be able to play 
right? So regardless of what version your Revit model is, I still want this to be operable. I don't want a user having to contact me and say, why did this, this script fail, right? That's gonna make them less likely to run a script in the future, right? Because it didn't run smoothly. So by hard coding the category name into your script, you won't have these many issues. Another thing you can see here in the view dropdown, not very friendly there, right? So of course you can't have two floor plans called level one, but you can have a floor plan, an area plan, a ceiling plan, et cetera, called level one, right? So how does my user know which level one to pick? That's really confusing, <laughs> right? Not to mention that this dropdown, I mean, how many, how many views do you have in your typical Revit models, Kyle? I mean, crap, this list Hundreds. gets really long, right? Like, and then it, it's based off of, it's not actually alphabetical, it's based off of the order in which they were created in some versions. So at most cases, you're gonna be scrolling to the very bottom of the list, right? And you can't really use your keys to get to the where you want because it's not alphabetical. So rather than that, what we'll do is we hard code it. So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm actually having the user specify the name with a string. Now, some would say that's more difficult. I would argue with that for a few reasons, but really all you have to do is copy the view name from either the you know, right click in the project browser, rename it, copy it, or from the properties, paste it in Dino Player, right? And you can see here in this particular script, it's intended for plans. So I've actually filtered down the view list. I'm looking at all views within my project. I filtered it down to just look at floor plans so that when my user specifies the view name with a string, it will only be looking at floor plans. Now, of course, you could have your user specify this, right? You could have it to where that is an input, maybe as an integer. You could say zero for a floor plan, one for an area plan, two for a reflected ceiling plan, right? And have a, have a list.create and have that as an additional input, right? This particular script works specifically with floor plans. Some of my occupancy scripts just work with area plans. So it depends on really where we want to uh, have this user interface, whether it's you know, something that, that you want them to input or something that you want to hard code, just like the category, right? Now, last, we have our outputs. I like to provide outputs because, once again, people are a little bit timid to use Dynamo. So if we, within Dynamo Player, can tell the user, this is what changed, right? So when they actually run that script, they say, oh, this is the information that got updated. They're much more likely to use the interface and be more accustomed to the, the, I feel like a lot of users, especially just standard Revit users, they feel like the loss of control when they use Dynamo, right? It's like, I don't know what just got updated. Things get deleted. What just happened? And I need to go and check everything in my model to see if it still exists, right? <laughs> but if we can tell the user, nope, just these five elements got updated, right? It, I think it soothes some of that fear, right? Now with watch nodes, and that's really the only output that we can give within Dynamo Player, I'm gonna show you a few ways that we can manipulate these, of course. It's actually required that you do both. You have to rename it and you have to tell it to be an output. So you can't leave your watch node as named watch, okay? A lot of users and my Dynamo users will contact me and be like, why, why won't this display as an output? In Dynamo, I told it to be an output you have to rename it, okay? That's actually required. So once you do that, then you can have that as an output, right? So you can see here in my print set by sheet revision, it actually displays which sheets got added to that print set, right? So my users can quickly go down and say, oh, all right, these 150 sheets got added, that looks good, right? It also is a really wonderful way to, for the user to know that it actually worked, right? Sometimes we can't get rid of the run completed with errors as hard as we try, right, Kyle? I know that you've had that issue because I, for the yes. life of me, 
sometimes cannot get rid of errors. And, and it so, makes people uh, nervous. It makes people really nervous. The, yeah. And I, you know, even if somebody ran the script and it worked as expected, they don't know that it worked, mm -hmm. right? So like it ran with errors. And I get those calls like, hey, I ran the script and it ran with errors. I'm like, well, go check your data and see if it worked, <laughs> right? Did you, did you check the schedule? Did it update, <laughs> you know? So by providing an output, they can say, oh, okay. Yeah, it says that it ran with errors, but still it did something, right? It's not null or question marks or whatever, okay? So I find that to be really useful. You can see here that uh, what I'm doing with my, with my watch node is I'm actually creating a list. So you can see here, this one that's creating areas actually tells me the area with the element ID, the area name, and then the area number. And the way that I've done that is I basically just got those parameters, right? Element name. This is actually the list of the areas that was created from the area create node. And then also getting those uh, numbers from the areas, right? So then I create that list. I transpose that list so that it basically groups them based off of their, uh, their index. And then I feed that to the watch node, tell it to be the output, rename it. We're good to go, OK? So you don't just necessarily have to provide uh, one single form of of output, whether it's the element or a parameter. And you also don't have to provide three watch nodes or three separate output nodes, right? You can kind of combine those into one general list. So the output is a little bit more minimal and maybe easier to read for your user. I've done tricks before where I've had like a note at the end that re using the if kind of logic that you showed earlier that says, yes, this ran and it you know, creative floor plans or whatever. But what I like about this approach is it actually shows you a list of what it created and there's element IDs there. So you can actually go kind of hunt and peck through the model if someone's savvy enough with how to do that under the manage tab to see what those elements that were created were and verify right away if they actually Absolutely. exist and if it did the thing it was supposed to. That's great. Now, Kyle, did you know that if you actually click on this blue number, the element ID, it will actually acts as the highlight in model? So go. if you actually click on it, it will say this element is in view and this, this element isn't visible in this view. You want to mm -hmm. open a view that is visible and it will actually take you to a visible view. Okay. So it's actually super beneficial, right? And as I train people in Dynamo, I really just try to train people in Dynamo player at this point. And if they start to really enjoy it and start to really start asking a lot of questions, then I call and tell them <laughs> to take my Dynamo course, right? And become uh, one of the at least modifiers, right? Yep. Um, but absolutely, 100%, Kyle. At very least, somebody could go in, they could type the element ID in, right? And then find that element, um, interface with it in a very different way. Now, as you were saying, I also like to provide information as to why the script failed, right? So in this specific uh, script here, it's actually reading an Excel file and placing families and updating parameter names. Hugely helpful, especially for some of our uh, lab planning teams and things like that. They get Excel lists from the client with all the specialty equipment they need, right? So essentially here, you can see that with a string, I'm saying specify family and the family must be loaded in. If that family isn't loaded in, I obviously get an error, right? I get a null value. So basically, I use the lunchbox node, manage replace nulls. And I say, if it's null, say, no family found by that name specified. Right? So then it won't run at all. It basically says, stop the script. Provide this output and tell the user that something's wrong. Right? And this script actually takes a while to run. So that's like one additional catch of saying, before this runs and takes a few minutes, <laughs> right? Let's make sure that all of those parameters, if you will, that this script is looking for are available. Okay, it's kind of tricky to use the word parameter as its defined term, but regardless. A secondary way that I report errors from this script is, this is a little bit more complicated, but you can see I'm not actually using any custom nodes here. It's all out of the box nodes and 
my lovely Python script for my conditional format. But basically it's reading my Excel file, comparing that to the room numbers in my Revit file. And if, they, if it doesn't find that room number, it says verify Excel or Revit for the room number, whatever, right? So once again, before taking multiple minutes to run this script, it will actually uh, run and fail, not do anything. And then basically tell the user, go check Revit, go check your Excel. There's something that doesn't match, right? So just like Kyle was saying, providing an output for the user to say, hey, it completed with errors, it didn't run, but this is why. From my standpoint, this means less emails, less I am, <laughs> right? The user will say, my data is bad. <laughs> how, do, how do I fix this before I contact Dana and then I realize that I didn't follow the steps that I was supposed to follow, right? So that's what we're looking at there. So that's, I know I went a little long here. That wow, looks like perfect timing. <laughs> awesome. I did see, uh, we, we have time probably for two, maybe three questions. A really easy, quick one we got in the chat here was uh, in that list of element IDs that you output on the uh, first output in Dynamo Player slide that you had, would it be possible to list the, the global IDs in there, the GUIDs as well as maybe an additional sub list item? Not okay. sure, not sure why, like the really long, like 20 uh, digit, ID number. That's something you would just add as another sublist item for that, correct? Because the Absolutely. natural output is to have that appended to the element that's being created, but it would be really easy to add additional There's... parameters and information. Yep, absolutely. And I feel like the more, right? I mean, everything, the way to master Dynamo is to figure out how to master working with those lists, right? So if we can figure out of course, the logic between, behind how all of these lists work and thinking about how element IDs and Revit work, we can start to break down that logic and then output what we want our user to see, right? What makes sense for them to see. Um, and I think that once again, that breaks down the fear of our Revit user being like, what is this gibberish that I'm reading in Dynamo? Like, I have no idea what any of this means. The more transparent we can make it, I think the, the more inclined people will be to use these tools. Exactly, Let bring that barrier down so that they're interested in learning more. So there's another question about the kind of customization aspect of these things. So I, I like that you stated, you try to keep things as default as possible. That's also kind of my personal approach in Dynamo for the exact same reasons of, you don't have to always be chasing custom packages and deploying those to people. But what about that Python script from, from Richard that you've implemented? How does that carry from script to script as you send it to other people or share it? That's a really good question. And I would say that ties back to what Richard was talking to and how things are replicated, right? Um, so essentially in, within Smith Group, we have one central location where all the scripts are copied from to each person's desktop. So I know that if I make a change to the if node, um, it will replicate out to people's computers. However, uh, we actually talked last week about creating that as a Smith Group custom node because I use it so frequently, right? So it would be obviously much uh, smarter for me to custom, uh, to make that a package node that I could easily replicate through to multiple. So I just have to edit that once and then all the scripts that contain it get updated. That would be way smarter, right? Yep, exactly. All right, I'm gonna ask you a little bit more of a meta one because um, I think you guys have a really awesome way of, to see, see that you're actually tracking in your company who's using what scripts and how often and, and mm -hmm. have kind of a data interface and all that stuff is, Fantastic. I want to know a little bit more about um, has like the user base and the kind of passionate people surrounding Dynamo increased and or um, has this created basically passionate people that have become champions of Dynamo and wanted to kind of join forces with you guys or think up new ideas for scripts that have helped basically the growth of the company. That is interesting. 
An incredible question. Great question, Kyle. Um, so it, that's it's a few pieces. And hopefully I don't get lost in answering this because there's the really, really wonderful pieces in that. So first off, uh, we have an, a knowledge portal that we have within Smith Group. And I reach out to individual disciplines as well as individual offices, project teams, and I push the certified scripts, right? So I say, hey, did you guys know that we have these 60 certified scripts? Let me give you a quick hour long presentation. You guys can jump in there, run some Dynamo player scripts with me. We'll go over all the resources where you can find all the information on the scripts and you know, go over all that good stuff, right? Now, because our standard workflows within our BIM guidelines and procedures at Smith Group have started to incorporate Dynamo, you're almost, as long as you're following Smith Group protocol and guidelines, you're almost forced to use Dynamo, right? So we're teaching it in all of our BIM courses, we're teaching it as part of our standard workflows. It's in our documentation, et cetera. So we, you know, you don't know what you know, don't know, right? As a standard Revit user, you may not even know that Dynamo exists, let alone that Smith Group has 60 plus certified scripts, not to mention all of the project specific scripts um, that we've created. So I think that is the first thing, is sharing, whether it's by brute force or not, right? By me reaching out to people and individual teams and saying, let me present to you at lunch. The office will pay for your lunch, whatever it might be, right? To entice people to learn about how Dynamo can benefit them. Uh, and that includes project architects, project managers, right? Because then they know, hey, my project team could be saving tons of time by util utilizing these Dynamo player scripts. Um, where was I going next? I knew I was going to get lost in it. <laughs> so then in addition, absolutely. We, we, one thing that we utilize is, is, uh, Microsoft teams, uh, especially working remotely. Mm -hmm. It's become such a huge, huge, uh, you know, just wonderful way to collaborate. Right. So we actually have what we refer to as the tip community technology and practice. And in there we have a forum. So every time that I, I certify a script, whether I created it or I'm just certifying it for somebody else, I post it there. Hey, a new certified script exists and this is what it does. We also have a script catalog that we can tag things as certified sketched or what have you. So people can actually go in and search just for certified scripts. And within there, it actually has an image of the script and a description tells you all the custom packages that it uses, et cetera. It's a little bit more detailed. Um, but then also within teams, we have a help desk and within the help desk, people can go in there and they can say, Hey, I tried to run the script and it didn't work. Or, Hey, has anybody created a script that automatically places my columns for me or what have you? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times before I even create a script, I'll go in there and say, Hey, has anybody done this yet? Right. I don't want to have to recreate the wheel. So it's just a really wonderful place to have something to collaborate with the entire office. And of course, Smith group is large enough to where we have a huge community of people already working on stuff. Um, now, with what we're tracking and uh, Dynamo DC, for those of us in Dynamo DC, we actually had Tim in present to us on how all of these tracking tools can be used. And so um, one thing that essentially Smith Group has created is what we call a logging node. Okay, it's a node that I throw into all of my scripts that are certified, so that anytime that script is run, it pushes data to Richard's interface, right? And so with that, let's see if I can actually pull this up in Teams here, because it's really awesome, <laughs> is we can actually view, as he was showing in his slide, different uh, scripts and how they're used per office, per discipline, et cetera. So if I pull this over here, hopefully you guys could see it. So oh, going the, for grass the live demo. Grass, I know, I'm scared. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> so the grasshopper and dynamo usage. So you see here, it's actually a Power BI interface. We're really lucky to have Power BI. Those of you who have it, learn it. It's incredible. Um, so that's I a can whole other class in itself, I think. Oh my goodness, it is. But I, there's tons of resources on it, just like everything else, right? You can Google it and watch some videos, and it's really easy interface, luckily. Um, much easier than I find Excel to be in some cases with creating pivot tables and crazy things. Mm -hmm. So 
essentially I can come in here and we have a whole bunch of different tabs in how we track these usages, right? One I like is tool use and tool use by discipline. So I can see what my most popular scripts are. One thing that I actually will track with this and that the most common one is the detail renumber. You know, we are all wondering what it was. <laughs> it has uh, 1400 runs. Wow. So, <laughs> really proud of that. So essentially that one will uh, renumber the details based off of the grid that Smith Group tells you to number by. Okay, saves you a lot of time. You can actually do that for a group of sheets or just your active sheet. Now with this, one thing that I like to do is I like to hunt in here and see which offices aren't using the tools, right? Because I like to go and I like to contact different offices and say, hey, I see nobody is using my occupancy scripts. Can I give a presentation on life safety? right? Or what have you. And I can use that kind of in the back end. Also, if a script that I find is, is run way more than it probably should be, <laughs> I'll contact that user and say, why are you running it so much? Is it something that maybe I could make better, right? Are you running it on a group rather than an individual? Hmm. Are you, you know, how can we make this so you don't have to run it 800 times? How can we get it so that you run it 20 times? Right. So using these metrics isn't just a show and tell of like, oh, these are my awesome users, which it is. Right. And I love to present this as when I give my monthly meetings or however often you do it, you know, showing those as stars. Like, look, this person ran Dynamo 300 times last month. That person's awesome. Right. Like make love them it. stars that makes them feel special. Right. Not only that, it also kind of acknowledges them as someone who is very familiar with Dynamo in the office, right? Rather than just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So working around it, around it backwards, so. Yeah. yeah, I think we have a few more questions, but we're kind of short on time. So how about Dana, would you share with people your Twitter handle in case people want to find you on Twitter and reach out to you with questions? I know that, I know that my name is super hard. So I'm actually, I'm sorry for the, for the buzzing through these. I'm just going to go back to the beginning here. So it's at Dana DeFilippi. One L, two P's. And you can That'd find me there. That'd be a great way to follow up. I think I love that you ended on the kind of, uh, you know, sharing and distributing knowledge and what scripts are available because that's a huge piece as well as kind of deputizing the people that are passionate and and finding the places where maybe usage is lacking or there's an opportunity to use these things that are readily available more. So I think that was an awesome way to end the session today. Thanks both to Dana and Richard for spending the time to prepare and present to us today. And just a reminder to everyone that this session is gonna be going up onto YouTube directly afterwards. So if you wanna share, if you learned a lot of tips and exciting things today, go ahead and send it out to your network. And then please join us again next Thursday as we have that three person panel that's looking at creating new things, companies, et cetera. Well, thank you guys. And hopefully all of you can take Dynamo back to your office and make everybody Dynamo users. That'd be fantastic.